Greetings, everyone. Welcome back to the channel. We are finally here with Gene Hoagland, and I apologize for just now getting around to doing a video about him, but because he is so legendary, I wanted to do something different and also very special for him. So not only will this video be um, full of reactions to various projects that Gene has been a part of, but I also want to chronologically go through his biography a little bit. I'll try to go about things as best I can in a chronological order, but because Gene has been a part of multiple projects at the same time, it will be tough to kind of label certain things in order, but I will do my best to try to keep it relatively organized. So with that out of the way, get comfortable, grab a snack, get something to drink, uh, loosen up your neck muscles because there's a whole lot of thrashing ahead and we're gonna be here for a while. So, with that out of the way, the majority of the information that I'm going to be reading off is going to be from uh, John Wiederhorn, who is the author of a HarperCollins book, Louder Than Hell, The Uncensored History of Metal. I will put links to all the sources that I gather information from, and of course there will be links to any footage that is used as well in the description, and I'll also add it to the credits at the end of the video if any of you want to check any of this stuff out. So, to kick things off, we're going to begin with Gene's journey into the band Dark Angel. Dark Angel, who opened for Slayer at numerous LA area shows, were also friends with Hoagland, and when drummer Jack Schwartz was ousted after their 1984 debut, We Have Arrived, Hoagland stepped in without missing a beat. Not only did he up the skill level for the band's 1986 album Darkness Descends, an album with such rapid beats that many consider it the bridge between thrash and death metal, Hoagland also wrote lyrics for the majority of the album. When guitarist Jim Durkin left the band in 1989, Hoagland wrote most of the guitar parts and lyrics as well, and he played many of the rhythm guitar tracks on Dark Angel's 1989 album Leave Scars and 1991's Time Does Not Heal. I always loved the guitar as well as the drums, he says. In seventh grade, I took a beginner's instruments course and I wanted to play drums, but they only had violas, violins, cellos, and wood instruments. So they handed me a viola. I played it like it was a guitar, using a quarter as a pick. Then a friend lent me an acoustic guitar and I taught myself how to play. Thrash metal was the easiest kind of guitar to play because you didn't have to play any pretty chords. You could just play mean, vicious power chords, so I picked that up pretty quickly. Dark Angel was still a significant force on the thrash scene in 1992 when they fell apart. Vocalist Ron Reinhardt abruptly quit the band, and since it had taken the group a full 10 months to find Reinhardt, Hoagland wasn't ready to endure another lengthy audition process, so he also left, and Dark Angel fizzled away. Alright guys, so now we're going to check out a live performance of Dark Angel as they play the song No One Answers. You can tell Dark Angel already has a, uh, a pretty big presence in the area. I mean, look at all those people in the crowd. Crunch. God. 
God, dog. <laughs> Yo, for the time, this is absolutely crazy. Like, when you think of thrash metal, this is the kind of stuff that you picture in your mind. I mean, they're right up there with Slayer as far as just the overall intensity of the, the thrash beat itself. Oh, man. And this is a time, too, where it was so raw and brutal back then. Uh, it, you probably wouldn't be caught wearing earplugs either, the band members or the people out in the crowd. So you just, you ain't, you, you're going to go deaf by the end of the show, and everybody's just going crazy. Good times for sure. Shout out to Jackson Guitars, too. A good friend of mine plays one. Even back then, Gene was a, an absolute monster. That dude's just chilling right there. Yo, the energy in this song is crazy. Y'all take note of Gene's uh, drum set and just like the type of equipment that he uses early on. And we're going to compare it to the stuff later on down the road, too. This song is just 100 miles an hour the whole time.
Yep, this is old school thrash right here. The amount of endurance that you have to have to be able to get to a set like this. Okay, that kind of energy, absolutely insane. All right, let's move on to the next phase of Gene's life. A band known as Death. A month after leaving Dark Angel, Hoagland found out Death was looking for a drummer to replace Sean Reinhardt. Despite mixed past interactions with frontman Chuck Schludender, Hoagland flew to Florida and tracked the drums for individual thought patterns in three weeks. While he enjoyed the experience, it wasn't quite what he had expected. I thought, wow, this is death. We're going to put together this ball-crushing, storming death metal album that's going to stomp everybody else out, recalls Hoagland. Then Chuck sent me a riff tape that was anything but death metal sounding. When I got to Florida, Chuck sat me down and I learned all the songs on guitar and all the songs are being played way up high on the A string and the high E. So I said... Hey Chuck, why don't we try taking some of these riffs and playing them a lot lower and making them really chunky? I transposed a lot of individual thought patterns and hopefully made it sound a lot more powerful. Despite the significant role Hoagland had writing and arranging with Death on individual thought patterns and its 1995 follow-up Symbolic, he was a sideman in the band. After the initial transition of taking a distant back seat to Schluderner was passed, he soon realized being out of the spotlight had its advantages. With Dark Angel, I was a taskmaster, he says. I'm sure the rest of the band thought I was a dick yelling at them if they didn't make rehearsal or if they were slacking. But with Death, I was like, hey, all I gotta do is play drums. Chuck does all the interviews and deals with all the business and administrative stuff. I didn't have to concentrate on writing riffs or lyrics. I got to concentrate on just being a drummer which is what I wanted to do from the start. So since Death had these jazz elements anyway, I was able to bring in some of my wackier influences like Steve Gadd and Dean Castronovo and let them fly along with the brutal metal beats. By the time Death finished the even less savage symbolic, Hoagland realized he wanted to be in a more extreme and heavier band. So when Death dissolved in late 1995, he sought new blood. Okay, so now we're going to check out a drum playthrough of the song Overactive Imagination. And this is going to be a more uh, drum-oriented and drum-focused video, so I'll be able to actually see his playing more in depth and maybe comment on a few of his uh, stylistic choices as well. That's interesting. I feel every uh, every measure like that. It really goes with it. Puts it as part of the backbeat. Everything he's playing is open-handed, too. Uh, so just real quick, open-handed playing. Uh, he's got his kit set up like a right-handed drummer, but he's playing all of his main um, main eighth note sticking on the uh, like the ride cymbal and the hi-hat. He's doing it with his left hand instead, instead of uh, playing cross stick like this. Which reminds me, I need to look up, is he actually left-handed or right-handed? I need to do that in a moment. Imagination, the 
The past, what, uh, four to eight measures was really interesting sounding because it almost sounded like the guitar riffs were still doing like that triplet feel, but Gene had transitioned to a straight feel with the um, with the thrash beat. It Somehow it still kind of ended up melding together. Very interesting sonically to hear that. Definitely a triplet feel now. Back at it. I love how that little fill breaks up the backbeat. It, like it's it's so tasteful, but it, it it sounds really good too. Man, that was fire. I like that. Uh, very interesting combination of triplet transitions to straight feel, uh, the way that he was able to break the standard backbeat up in, uh, with that, that snare drum to hi-hat fill that he did. Very cool stuff. Like that track a lot. So it's time to go on to the next phase of Gene's life, Strapping Young Lad. Gene was introduced to his sonic soulmate for the next decade, strapping young lad frontman Devin Townsend at an Iron Maiden slash Fear Factory concert at the Palace in L.A. The two hit it off and agreed to get together and jam a few days later. At the end of the first jam, he gave me a demo of new songs to learn, Hoagland says. We only jammed four times for the City album, once in early March 1996, once in May and twice in July, and then we went to track the record. We didn't want to burn ourselves out on the material before we recorded, and it came out great. I was so stoked to be in Strapping because the songs were engaging enough on their own, so the drums didn't have to be really busy like death. I got to be a totally different kind of drummer and play things that served this chaos that was coming out of Devin's head. For Hoagland, being in Strapping Young Lad was creatively rewarding in a way he hadn't yet experienced. The band was jagged, edgy, and explosive, as unpredictable as a schizophrenic off his meds and the concert shuddered with musical revelation. I really felt like we were changing people's lives every night, Hoagland says. We were bringing a jaw-dropping experience to every live show, and people were like, holy fuck, who is this band? I came to see the headliners, and holy fuck, this band ripped my head off. In addition to playing with Strapping Young Lad on 1997's City, 2003's SYL, 2005's Alien, and 2006's The New Black, Hoagland accompanied Townsend on three of his solo albums, 1998's Affinity, 2000's Physicist, and 2001's Terrier. The solo stuff brought out another aspect of my drumming, Hoagland says. I recorded Infinity on a five-piece kit with a single bass drum. 
If you as a musician step out from behind your giant kit and play something really stripped down, you're really going to get to your own essence. I tried to play really tasty and nothing out of the ordinary. I channeled Tico Torres from Bon Jovi more than I did Filthy Animal Taylor from Motorhead. Being with Strapping Young Lad was fun and it kept Hoagland busy. However, it provided little financial security. In the beginning, the band was so broke he couldn't afford to pay rent. And even when they became more established, Strapping's extreme music was hardly a road to riches. Still, the thrill of breaking new musical ground outweighed the drawbacks, at least most of the time. Man, we ate dirt for years, Hoagland says. But strapping was a huge character-building process for me. I had to live in my car for a month because I had nowhere to stay, and I couldn't stay with the other members because they were having their own situations. I'd grab a shower when I could and a meal when I could. There wasn't a lot of food and not a lot of places to live for a while, but I was dedicated to it and stoked to be a part of it. When Townsend broke up strapping young lad in 2007, Hoagland didn't know what he was going to do. He was just starting to make decent money, got his own place, and was relaxing in the bubbling hot tub of his labor when the drain was suddenly opened. So, this next song is actually going to be the playthrough for Skeksis, which is Strapping Young Lad song. Uh, this song was requested, as well as Love, um, but I'm going to save a reaction to that song for another video. So for now, we're just going to stick with the Skeksis playthrough for this one. <laughs> I can't explain it, but I really like how this sounds. Consistency of that kick pattern is crazy. Man, there's so much creativity in these drum parts. really lends itself well to just the chaos of the guitars. I mean, the song's in 4-4, but it almost sounds like it's in a different time signature. There's so much crazy stuff going on. All right, this part's cool sounding. Notice how Gene's kit really hasn't changed much over the years. He might be playing different drums, but the way he stylistically sets his drum setup and the equipment that he's overall using, uh, it's been pretty much the same.
Please take note of that open hi-hat work. Okay, now you don't see that too often. When you're playing both bass drums in unison like that at the exact same time, it's usually always alternating. No one does that, you know? <laughs> okay, let's keep going. This song is fucking crazy. God, he's, he's in the zone. He's completely in the zone with all this. Woo. Double China symbol roll right there. I don't know why, but I love the way the snare hits on the one, the three, and the four like that. It sounds really cool in conjunction with the guitar riffs. <laughs> And then of course he's got the China going on the uh, on the offbeat. <sighs> that song was ridiculous, and in a good way. <sighs> There's so much chaos going on with the guitars in that song. And Gene was able to hold his own with it. I mean, like I pointed out a minute ago, having the snare hits on the one, I believe it was the one, the three, and the four, and then alternating from the ride uh, to the China symbol, having the China be on the upbeat, or, or no, actually it might have been on the two. I, I don't know. There was, there was so much going on, and that's not even including the kick patterns that were going on in the song. The song was absolutely crazy. Okay, we got to move forward. Next. Following the end of Strapping Young Lad, the inventor of a TV cartoon band contacted him about playing death metal drums on an album based on the TV show. Metalocalypse only had about three episodes out when Brendan Small contacted me, Hoagland says. I didn't know what to do. It's one of my favorite shows now, but at the time, I admit I didn't know what to make of it. But I figured, what the hell, let's do it. Small sent Hoagland 17 sketchy demos basically the same song fragments and snippets that were actually used on the show. So the two musicians spent hours fleshing out and then tracking a couple of songs a day. To everyone's surprise, the Death Album debuted at number 21 on the Billboard album chart in 2007, selling almost 34,000 copies in its first week. 
This led to the inevitable follow-up in 2009, which was accompanied by a largely sold-out tour with Mastodon. The formula was pretty much the same for the second record, Hoagland says. It was even more hectic, actually, because I did Brendan's solo record, Galacticon, at the same time as we did Death Album 2. Hoagland toured with Death Clock extensively and worked on the band's 2013 album, The Doomstar Requiem. And after the Adult Swim program at Alocalypse, which birthed this animated band Death Clock, was canceled, Hoagland continued working with Small and Brendan Small's Galacticon, appearing on the band's self-titled debut as well as its upcoming second record, Galacticon 2. Okay, so this next playthrough that we're going to be doing a reaction to is of Galacticon's On My Way. It's going to be another drum cam playthrough, so we'll be able to get a much more in-depth look at what Gene's doing behind the kit. <clears throat> Langin' boots. Not easy to do. That gallop pattern is clean. I like how he's accenting the guitar riff uh, with the bell pattern on the ride. I love how relaxed and zoned in he can get, even when he's playing what seems just to be a, just a bunch of complicated patterns. Like it's really kind of mesmerizing to see. China accents on the upbeat. Wasn't expecting this. Got some off pattern stuff going on, I like it. I love Tom work when it's in unison with the 16th note double bass pattern. Okay, so to anybody else that happens to be a drummer, take, take just take note of what he's doing with his hands, right? 
he's alternating between the hi hat and that um that little china splash that he's got. Just alternating between that, right? But it's what he's doing with his right hand, circling around the around the toms like that. It's the equivalent of the whole uh, pat your head, rub your belly thing, like game that you can like try to play or try to get people to do. The coordination that it takes to pull that off cleanly is something that only a small percentage of individuals can do. Doing that alternating pattern with the hi-hat and the china symbols on the upbeat like that is a Gene staple. You hear it in other songs that he does too. Yet another masterfully done song. Just, man. All right. I... Y'all seen it. Y'all seen it. Okay. Wow. All right. Let's move on to the next part. In 2010, Hoagland added his unmistakable playing to Fear Factory's comeback album, Mechanize, and toured with the band. Mechanize is the seventh studio album by Fear Factory. And it is the only album to feature Gene Hoagland on drums and the first since 2001's Digimortal to include original guitarist and founding member Dino Cazares, who rejoined the band after a reconciliation with lead vocalist Burton C. Bell in April 2009. The album was produced by Reese Fulber, who had not produced or been involved with the Fear Factory album since Archetype. The album has received mostly positive reviews from fans and music critics, being praised for its very aggressive and heavy sound. In its first week of release, the album sold 10,000 copies. So this next reaction video that we're going to be doing is going to be a live performance that Fear Factor did for the song Mechanize. It wasn't really easy to find footage where Gene was actually the one on stage. A lot of the Fear Factory footage that I found actually had Raymond Herrera on the drum set. So, um... Yeah, I didn't really have a whole lot of options here, but uh, we're still going to go ahead and check this out anyway. I like how clearly you can hear the attack on the kick drums. I like that shirt Burton got on.
What makes Fear Factory songs so crazy is the double bass burst that are done. It's a lot of stop and go, and that's very difficult to do. Trust me, I know. Check out my Christ Plotation drum cover also if you haven't already done so. Dino's a great guitarist, but he's he's pretty polarizing in his own way, but uh, that's a subject for another video. I just don't know if I could do a whole set of songs like that. That, as a drummer, I mean, it, you know, salute to Gene and Raymond Herrera as well, because these songs are absolutely exhausting to do. You need to have mastered your techniques completely uh, as far as energy conservation and your economy of motion. It needs to be very minimal in order to have the stamina to be able to do a whole set like that. Wow. Testament began recording their 10th studio album on June 20th, 2011. Paul Bostaff was unable to take part in the recording due to a serious injury, although he was expected to rejoin when the band began touring to support the album. Bostaff was replaced by Gene Hoagland, who had played drums with Testament on their 1997 album, Demonic. It was funny, recalls Hoagland. Testament recorded all the demos for the Dark Roots of Earth album using the quote-unquote Gene file on the Toon Track drum simulator program Metal Foundry. They handed me these recordings and it's like, well, these are your drums on our demo that we're going to give you to listen to for the first time. Can you play them? And I'm like, yeah, no problem. Nowadays, I can learn an entire album in a couple of days anyway and then come in and track it in a day. But I love those guys and it was fun to work with them again. With Testament, I try to be as Gene Hoagland as I can be, he says. I definitely want the drums to sound like what Eric's looking for and I'm always trying to capture and enhance his vision. So I don't mind when I get songs really demoed out. Cool, let me learn what you put on the demo and let me genocize it and we'll take it from there touring with testament is very enjoyable it's a well-oiled solid metal machine that knows what it's doing on january 21st 2022 the band and longtime drummer gene hoagland announced on their respective social media accounts that he had once again left testament to pursue an exciting new chapter of his career and free agency with all that it will entail on March 1st, it was announced that drummer Dave Lombardo had rejoined the band in time for the North American leg of the Bay Strikes Back tour, which became Testament's first major outing with Lombardo, who had left the band before the 1999-2000 tour for The Gathering. Okay, for the Testament reaction we're going to do, we're going to be checking out a drum cam of the song True American Hate. This is by courtesy of Pearl Drums Finland, and it was played at the Tusca Open Air Metal Festival in 2013.
love his fills. Everything was placed exactly where it needed to be to match with the guitar, too. I love how his snare can cut above the mix, too. It's got a great tone. And that bell pattern sounds good. Oh, those triplets are good. That double bass triplet rub, it sounds so good in this song. Like I mentioned earlier too, uh, Gene's kit, his, his equipment, it doesn't change. Everything's still in the same place and it, it's just remained untouched. Interesting that he has two hi-hats right there. I love the way that the bell sounds in the middle of that skank beat.
That song is a banger. Good God, man. <laughs> I would have loved to have been there for that show. Whew. Pitch Black Forecast is an American heavy metal supergroup formed in 2005 with a lineup consisting of Mushroomhead frontman Jason Popson and strapping young lad drummer Gene Hoagland and former Integrity bassist Steve Rockhorst. Formed in Ohio back in 2005 under the name Absentee, they released their debut album Absentee in 2008 featuring guest contributions from Lamb of God frontman Randy Blythe and Human Furnace of Ringworm. So I wasn't able to find a whole lot of footage of Pitch Black Forecast, but I was able to find a show that they played at uh, Peabody's, wherever that's at, in 2010. So the song is going to be Season in Hell. I dig how thrashy this song is, but man, this, this is straight up new metal shit going on. Did he just break that stick? Power in that blast beat. (laughs) 
Man, that song, um, <laughs> uh, like I mentioned, a whole lot of thrash, but a lot of new metal in that one, too. And, and I ain't gonna lie, I do enjoy me some new metal. I was uh, just going into my teenage years, uh, early 2000s, 2000, 2001, so um, music like that was definitely right up my alley, you know, so I liked it. <laughs> I'm not looking to more from, from this band. All right, guys, we've finally reached the conclusion. Uh, this isn't everything that Gene has been a part of. He's done uh, guest spots in other bands. Um, I mean, he's even uh, did a little drumming for like Opeth and Old Man's Child. And, you know, so I just wanted to mainly cover like his main projects in this video because this is already a really long video. And if you made it to the end of this video, um, I salute you and thank you. I did say in some of the comments on the community posts that I that I made that it was going to be a much longer video. Uh also, you know, just some last thoughts on Gene. Uh, he's an absolute legend. I've said this before. Uh, his drumming, his technicality, his precision, accuracy, endurance, creativity, his dexterity, just the fact that he's such a workhorse. I mean, he's got multiple projects going on at one time. Uh, he it's hardly able to spend time at home because he's always on the road or he's always in a studio somewhere working, just working, working, just drumming, working, just... He's always got something going on, so he deserves all the praise in the world for that. Uh, he's a paragon, you know, just in the, not just with metal drumming, but just with the overall impact that he's had on the genre in general. Uh, as a person, he seems like a genuinely, like, good guy, too, you know, so Gene, you're number one in my book, um... And thank you, you know, just just thank you for everything that you've done, all your contributions to to the, the world of drumming and to metal um, and being an inspiration for for drummers and, and other drummers and guys like me as well. So thank you, Gene. And thank you all for sticking around to watch the video. I've got more coming as far as music projects. So just stay tuned, guys. You know, I'll keep you updated in the community posts as as far as any updates are concerned. So, again, thank you. And I will catch y'all in the next video. If you enjoyed it, please don't hesitate to like and subscribe if you're not if you're not already. It greatly helps me out. Thank you all. Till next time.